So, um, yeah, my name is Alex. We've been uh, doing agile development at Rally for about seven years, and so you know it's been interesting because one of the things I noticed when I first started with Rally is that the, the stakeholders were always sort of waxing, you know, gloriously about about how wonderful agile was and how it's you know, kind of like a dream for them. And and so you know, hearing this over and over again, and and, and I, I was thinking, wow, there's just this weird, overwhelmingly positive thing going on. And, over time was that a lot of what was happening for, the, for them is that many of them had been on traditional projects for years and they'd been struggling with you know the, the, the sort of long delays, the long development cycles and so for them to be working with a, a team that's shipping software every eight weeks or so and patches every week and you know they're, they're getting lots of features very quickly, they're you know not spending as much money, they're, they're getting feedback, they're being able to respond to the market and improve incrementally. So there's a, a lot of just positive things going on for them. But what was interesting to me was that, that sort of there's an undercurrent of, of kind of concern. And what was interesting is, although as product managers, we were working very hard to sort of take into account you know, everything that people were working on and, and promote our roadmaps and, and make all this visible, uh, we're getting a lot of questions. And, and a lot of people were asking things like, you know, where are we headed? And, and why are we working on this feature and not that feature? And it, it just seemed like we were doing all the right things. Huh? That's right. You want to switch me over? Yeah, just because um, this is cutting out. Okay. You want to just take this and yeah. I'll use that instead? Yeah. All right. Give him a chair. Give me a chair? Yeah, then you sit in, in the path of the <laughs> I'll try. I'll try it like this. See how, how I do. So anyway, we were getting a lot of uh, sort of feedback, a lot of stakeholders asking, well, why aren't we building feature X? And what about feature Y? So even though we were putting a lot of time and energy into getting feedback and building the right things, you know, people were still kind of confused about where we were going. And, and so I started to think, well, maybe the Agile is like a dream kind of thing is not, not really an apt description. So when I was writing this talk, I, I, I tried to come up with a, a, a better metaphor, something that I felt was more appropriate for what was going on. Because on the product side, we were struggling too. We, were, we found we were, we were kind of, you know, shifting direction a lot and, and that kind of thing. And so the, basically the thought I came up with is that really Agile is more like beer. And the, the, reason, the, the reason is a little bit complicated. You know, if you, if you think about, you know, you know, going out for beer, you, you, you can easily, you know, have a, have a drink here and there. You can have one or two, no big deal. You start having six or seven drinks and sometimes there are issues. And so, you know, with, with Agile development, you start out, you ship a first increment and you know you you basically you know build only the most important features first you kind of wait um, until you get feedback to, to go out and back and round things out so you leave out the window dressing and then your sales team comes and says you know if we can you know only have this one um, you know, if you can build this one little feature for us very quickly, we can close this next big deal. And the, you know, then you try to build a couple more features to sort of experiment with an emerging market. And you know, then you sort of test the waters with an integration, or maybe you know you start building features in support of a, a partnership. And basically, what what's happening is something I like to call getting drunk on agile. And what what getting drunk on agile is 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 basically the the, the business is getting intoxicated to the. Uh, you know, on the, the sort of flexibility, the responsiveness to change. And it's, it's very hard to resist. And what you very quickly get is, is you've gone in lots of different directions at one time. Um, you're sort of, you're, you're not taking time to round out the corners. And you've got lots of partially done ideas in the market, which is, you know, a great way to sell lots of different things, but not a good route to long-term success with your customers. You also tend to end up with lots of customers with contradictory needs. So what I'm here to talk about today is sort of why I think you need a product council. Uh, Product Council is sort of the solution that we came up with that, that, that enabled us to, to basically get consistent buy-in, get alignment from the stakeholders, and, and basically follow a, a, um, a more consistent path towards our vision and, and roadmap, and ultimately this makes the product better over time. So we were thinking, well, we work on these eight-week releases. So we initially started out sort of doing a, what I call a release-oriented Product Council. And with the release-oriented Product Council, we, we we basically said, let's do a meeting every two weeks. Let's get all our stakeholders in the room every couple of weeks, and um, and and with that, we'll we'll sort of get all get everybody aligned so that each time we go into release planning, we kind of know um, we're all in agreement about what we're doing. So the first meeting we started out with in this cycle was the idea of sort of the bring your ideas meeting, and we we did it sort of in true agile fashion with a ton of, of sticky notes and. Uh, you know, up on the wall, and basically we, we, we said, everybody, it's a blank slate every release. You can come in with all the ideas you want for everything you think our product should do. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll, um, 
you know, get these up on the wall, you know, we'll find out the commonalities and, and, and we'll generally discuss it. And then, so typically these would be epics. These would be, you know, larger features that are going to take multiple iterations or, or maybe even multiple releases to implement. And then after the bring your ideas meeting, the product owners would go off and, and work on tr trying to understand these epics, trying to, to break them down into smaller pieces, get, get finer grain backlogs, because some of the, you, you can't just take a giant epic into release planning and expect to, to, to come out with a, you know, with a, with a, a plan that's you know, in line with what you expected as a product owner without breaking them out down, without talking to, to your developers. And so we'd spend the next couple of weeks, you know, sort of fleshing these out, and then we'd come back and hold another meeting, which is really sort of about the details in voting. We'd present the detailed backlogs for these, and then, you know, we, we'd um, sort of answer questions that the stakeholders had about what are the implications of each of these, these features, and the, the stakeholders would then start to kind of, um, would start to vote. Um, and the voting was an interesting process because on my product council, I've got a group of all kinds of different people. I've got sales reps, marketing people, so the support team. And typically the things that the support team are voting for are not remotely connected to the things that the sales team are voting for. So what we found is that, that coming out of the voting, we'd have completely inconclusive results, you know, where there would almost never be a plurality. And, and so as product owners, we would kind of go off and say, okay, what do we do? Um, and because the, the following meeting is sort of the presentation of our final backlog. So going into release planning, you know, what, uh, what are the backlogs that the development teams are actually going to be able to look at? And so we'd spend a couple weeks, you know, going through those backlogs and, um, and uh, trying to figure out how it, how it fit together best based on the voting as best as possible. And ultimately, we come back, present the final backlogs, and, th and then, uh, you know, the, our stakeholders would, would question why, why we did things. And it became a very contentious meeting because, you know, we've got, you know, the VP of services and the VP of support are kind of, you know, butting heads about, you know, well, we should do this to close deals. No, we should do this to make the agile customers better. And, you know, it's just, it, it's a very, uh, very tricky situation. But it did work for, for, for quite a while. Um, one of the other things we added on, because we're kind of, a, you know, trying to be good agilists, is we added the idea of a retrospective. So at the end, at sort of the fourth meeting in the eight-week cycle was always a, a sort of let's talk about what's working and what's not working. And inevitably, there's a lot of frustration that came out in the retrospective. And, and, and so ultimately, we, um, we, tried, we decided to kind of explore that in a little more depth and figure out, you know, what was going wrong with this product council process. So. The first thing, at least from my perspective, was that fundamentally it was too much work. As a product owner, I had to spend a lot of time just, just preparing all these backlogs, getting, getting together all these ideas that, 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 that were you know, really good ideas, but ultimately things that we might not be implementing right away. I, I have a database of about 2,000 feature requests. Actually, it's, it's probably closer to 2,500 at this point of, of you know, great ideas. You know, really, 2,200 of those are just wonderful ideas and things we should definitely do with the product. And the reality is that, that you know, out of those epics, you know, we're going to do 10 or 20 in a year. So th th there's, th there's just such a huge number of requests. And, and ultimately, it's a ton of work to be going through the, um, all those requests and, and, and uh, j just uh, sort of processing them, even though you're not going to be dealing with, with them. Um, the other thing that we found is that, that there's a, a fair amount of stakeholder stress, and I kind of liken this to the experience you get in a diner. So if you go into a diner, there's a sort of a, you know, often a huge menu, and, you know, with you know, hundreds of items to choose from, and frankly, a lot of them are not very good. I mean, so, so and, and whenever I go into a diner, you know, I, I basically know what I'm going to order. It's probably going to be a bacon cheeseburger and fries and maybe a chocolate malt. And, you know, because those are the things you can rely on to be good in a diner. And the rest of the menu, you kind of learn to ignore because it's just, there's just too much there. What we realized we were doing to our stakeholders is that we were giving them um, a diner menu, basically every single uh, release, you know, look at all the possible options and, 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 and pick all over again. And that's just leads to a level of cognitive overload that none of them really wanted to deal with. Um, ultimately, the, 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 the thing that, that we realized it was happening as a result of this was each stakeholder was, you know, looking at that dining menu, diner menu and finding their, their favorite thing. And, you know, so we ultimately realized that, that stakeholders were coming back with the, sort of the same thing over and over again. Regardless of whether it was really the most important thing for, for the sales VP to increase sales, they had sort of their pet feature that they would keep bringing up. And they'd go into our meetings and they would look for, you know, where's my pet feature? You know, I just need to make sure that it's here, you know, that I, that I, have, this pet, that, that I have this pet feature. And as soon as it disappears, um, the stakeholders would become anxious. 
because they couldn't track down the one thing that they were holding onto to keep them oriented throughout the process. So ultimately, we, we were having a lot of churn just because stakeholders were trying to track down that one item on the diner menu that they weren't able to keep a hold of. And finally, you know, eventually after you know, you know, an hour or so of debate in the meeting, eventually they'd be able to get that thing back up there on the board, and it'd be there, and they'd be happy, and, you know, and, and, and we could then move on. But it was just exhausting to go through this process and really stressful for them. I saw you know, all these stakeholders would come into the product council and they were, they were worried and nervous. You know, they, would, they would rush in, kind of you know, coming off a sales call or something, and they would say, well, you know, I, you know, I really feel like I need to be here because I need to be advocating on, on behalf of him, on behalf of the little puppy. You know? so, um, so that was a, you know, a challenge that we had with it. Another thing that we found was that, that basically doing this sort of once a release cycle thing um, led to kind of a bias toward churn. We found that it, it really meant that by default, we were going to rethink everything, every single release. So that, this was really the biggest problem was that we found we weren't making progress on longer term initiatives because we kept sort of re-voting and rethinking everything on a tactical level based on what's going on over the next eight weeks. You know, is there a feature we can ship in eight weeks that will in increase sales? Is there a, you know, a feature that we can ship in, in, in eight weeks that it will make a you know, big difference for our services team. And, and, and that was really, really tough. So another thing that happened is that, that, that we um, basically, we, had, we tended to, um, to, to really you know, go through this sort of very large list of, of potential features every, every release. And you know, I said that there's a database of 20, 2,500 you know, requests and 2,200 of them are, are um, you know, really good ideas. The other 300 are really bad ideas. And this, this, this process kept sort of you know, causing those items to, to pop up. And we'd, we'd talk about things. We'd talk about building Gantt charts into our product um, because that's what customers kept asking for. And, and, and we'd work and we'd figure out uh, you know, how, you know, how, to, how to teach the sales team that, no, you know, we don't need to give all these customers Gantt charts just because that's what they think they want. And um, we'd, we'd, we'd kill the Gantt chart thing. And then eight weeks later, it'd pop up again. Well, I've got five customers asking for Gantt charts. And um, so ultimately, it kind of felt like a game of whack-a-mole. You kind of you know, get rid of this, this, this problematic item, and it just comes, comes up back again uh, in eight weeks. Sort of more fundamentally, there's a, there's a bigger problem. One is, th and then really that's that everybody's got an opinion about how you should build your product. You know, the support team knows what their cases are. The sales team knows why they're losing deals. The, the sales engineers knows what, know what they're hard to explain. The support, uh, the, the services team knows what would help our customers get better at Agile. Of course, the engineers know what they would build if they were in charge. And uh, so ultimately, we have all these different opinions. And uh, the challenge is for product management is that they're basically most of them are wrong. Um, and, and this is for a fairly simple reason, you know, if you're familiar with sort of the story of the blind men and the, the elephant, you know, if you have a bunch of blind men around an elephant, one of them grabs the leg and thinks it's a pillar, and the other grabs the tail and thinks it's a rope, the other grabs the, 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 the trunk and thinks it's a tree branch, you know, fundamentally, um, each of these stakeholders is in a position to ask for the things that they need, but ultimately that's not what's for the best of the product. So the idea of having a completely democratic product council really kind of fell on its face. Um, because none of these people are really in a position to be look, seeing the whole. And ultimately, that's, the challenge is, you know, how as product owners do we basically work and do the job of sort of seeing the whole while allowing feedback and, and supporting participation, listening to all these opinions? You know, that's, that was a, kind of the challenge for us. So basically, you know, I started to think about, well, what, what really was the need for the, you know, for the product council? And, and fundamentally, what, what a product council is about is building alignment. Uh, it's, it's really about helping you manage opinions and make sure that each stakeholder has a, has a chance to have their opinion heard by the rest of the group, hear what other people want, and, um, and, and ultimately, you know, what they wanted more than anything else, anything else is a system that they can trust, you know, because the situation where they're, they're basically going into the room and they're, they, you know, they're kind of not, you know, not seeing that one item they want and then, and then looking, oh, there it is, you know, kind of thing, it's just not a pleasant experience for anybody involved. So basically, I, I went back to the drawing board and, and um, and, and sort of tried to rethink sort of how, um, you know, how can I redesign this process to, to, to be a little more aligned with what the stakeholders actually wanted. Um, so basically, you know, so last fall I happened to join the, um, the Kanban development mailing list and, and basically what we decided to do was a, a Kanban based approach to managing the, the, the product council. And so to the really quick summary of Kanban for anybody who is not familiar with it, the Kanban is a really simple series of, of essentially bins that potentially have limits on them. So I work items move from one bin to the other. And, and you know, we just used a wiki to, to store ours, but basically we had a list of you know, the work in progress um, that, that the development team is working on for the current release, uh, a list of the, the items that are ready for development, 
um, a list of the items active that we're actively exploring, and then and then sort of lower priority items that we either explored in the in the past or that that were were basically um, on hold. So ultimately, we 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 basically changed the way the meeting works to to focus more on you know on this kanban and kind of going through it. And so the discussion became less about sort of why is my puppy not in the upcoming release, but more about. Um, you know, are things in the right order? Are we researching the right, the best things we can be researching, given that we, we're only going to be actively exploring three things at a time? So it had a, a drastic reduction in the amount of churn that we had to do as, a, you know, the amount of sort of rethinking that we were constantly doing as, as product owners. Um, and the bigger thing that, that I noticed is it you know, just gave us a much stronger bias towards stability. So, so the items tended to move. Um, upward when it made sense, and items t are now tending to get sort of rethought when it makes sense, and there's there's less of this you know bias towards churn that we had before in the in the sort of reinvent everything every eight weeks. So that, that's not to th say things don't actually change, and items do frequently sort of you know that we're exploring we'll we'll get you know we'll get far enough in the exploring we'll decide it's not important anymore and we'll stop working on it, and sometimes items will will jump the queue if they're really highly urgent. But, but ultimately, there is a lot more sort of stability in this process. So, so we've got that bias towards stability. And um, ultimately, the, the other big benefit is it's much easier to maintain. Because as a product owner, I, I sort of spend um, you know, a small amount of time every, every uh, couple of weeks, you know, five minutes or so, sort of updating it so that, the, that, that it's consistently up to date based on what we're actually doing. And, um, and, and, and so that makes a big difference for me. Um, at, at a broader level, one of the things that we'd always struggled with was sort of the focus on the upcoming release. What are you know the, in the next? What are the features we're doing in the in the next eight weeks? It's a very tactical kind of conversation, and and the development team, of course, is focused on their iterations and releases, which is also you know tends to be focused at a fairly tactical level. And and one of the things that I found that as we move towards this Kanban de style of development, we um, we, uh, or the style of planning is that we were able to um, do more work around um, thinking about the bigger picture because going through the Kanban in a lot of cases would take takes you know it, it can take anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes you know just to talk about what's going on update people on the upcoming features that kind of thing and that leaves a fair amount of time to, to sort of think about the bigger picture so it's sort of the clouds lift and, 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 and we can actually have meaningful conversations with all the stakeholders you know about you know where are things going longer term where are um, Hey, what are we going to, you know, be doing? You know, wow, it's getting dark in here. <laughs> Fancy. Um, so, you know, where are we going longer term? Well, you know, what are what are what's our longer term focus? Because uh, because they can all sort of feel comfortable that their issues are taken care of. They always have a place they can go back to to see, you know, where exactly does my pet issue stand? Even if it's <laughs> stuck in the ideas bin, the lowest possible bin. In a lot of cases, that's a very satisfying thing for a stakeholder to to know that their idea it, it may be a good idea. It's not on the radar for the next release or even the next six months, but it's still here. It's still something we're thinking about. And that kind of reassurance that 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 these good ideas ideas are not going to be lost is actually, you know, quite valuable in allowing us to, to have these longer term discussions about, you know, are we prioritizing correctly and are there changing market conditions that really f are causing fundamental shifts beyond the, 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 the two or three small features in the next release. So the, the big consequence of all this is that, that um, you know, we, we've kind of moved away from these stories that, that you know, were very, you know, very granular and, and too focused for VPs. You know, as a user with a big monitor, I want to increase the number of columns I see so I can fit more content on my screen, which is a great story. And it's actually one that, you know, we were working on last week. Um, and, and, and it's, but it's not something that has anything to do with strategy. It, you know, it really doesn't have to do with, with market conditions. It doesn't have to do with partners. And it's the wrong level of granularity for, for, for that group of people to deal with. So, so moving up one level you know, has enabled our stakeholders really to relax. And, and that's you know, leading to much better results you know, within the group. So, so you know, basically, that's, you know, th that's been largely my experience. You know, I, I think you know, really within a product company, having a product council makes a huge difference in, in uh, getting alignment. And I think you know, getting a visible Kanban that's, that's actually very distinct from the thing you use with your development team makes a huge difference. Because you know, you take, taking your stakeholders or to, to see your development wall is lots of fun. But as soon as a VP is talking about your, you know, your stories that are finished in a day or two, you're, you're at the wrong level of detail. So get a visible Kanban that's useful for the stakeholders. And, and that makes a big difference. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't spend time with your stakeholders. I, you know, one of the things I found really valuable throughout this sort of process of, of developing our process here is that you know, sitting with each individual stakeholder is really key. And 
taking the time to spend an hour or so with you know with each of the VPs you know every every month every, not every month but every really every every couple of months to talk about you know what are the key things on your mind outside of the context of the product council makes them and, you know to go through the kanban with them to ask what they think about where things are is you know really important to making the, the the collective meetings go smoothly because they can ask questions about the things that they're uncomfortable with and they they get time to 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 uh, you know, have their have their opinions discussed in a little bit more detail, so they don't feel as much of a need, a need to sort of you know project that out during the larger meeting. Um, so ultimately, you know, I, I think you know you spend some time with the stakeholders, and and you're going to get more stable stakeholder support in the longer term. And and the hope in the end is that that ultimately you you know you can kind of get to this point where agile is more like a dream again. So, um, any questions from the audience? Yeah, right here. Yeah, I'm curious about a couple of things. Um, one, which is, I, I didn't see a limit on the number of ideas that you had in your Kanban, yeah. and that seems like a place where the blood pressure could get fairly high with everybody's heads. And the second part of the question is, um, if, if it's not democratic, you said the democratic thing is problematic, and I understand that. How then do you how then do you handle the Kanban to keep it somewhat what uh, you know benevolently uh, you know? Um, authoritarian. I don't yeah, know. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, it is what it is. It's kind of benevolently authoritarian because it is my job to synthesize all these all these opinions. So, so let me answer the first question. The, there's no limit on the, on the ideas just because I haven't had a need to limit it. Also, I have a separate database that stores customer feature requests. That is not going to Kanban. So for something to get promoted from from that database into ideas, somebody's got to bring it up during the meeting. And there's just not that, I think a lot of people recognize there are a lot of feature requests that are sort of lower, have lower business value, and so those don't get in. I, we would put it in a limit if it became a problem that just isn't one yet. And that's one of the interesting things about Kanban is that the limits really are dynamic. So we change them. You know, if we find they're not working, if we find we've got too much in, in one state and it's causing a problem, we'll change the limit and we'll move stuff out. Um, the other thing that we, that we often get in, in the meeting is we do get people saying, well, what about uh, you know, idea X that's way down here? And, and we say, well, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, is there something up here in the work in progress, in, in the stuff we're researching that we should take out? And there almost, uh, there almost never is. You know, and that's, that's, that's the interesting thing, is that, is that you, as long as you're actually asking people to make a decision between two items, you know, it generally seems to work out on its own. So. All right, I've got a question there, Jim. Um, how many people do you have dedicated uh, to this sort of on-site product owner role, such as yourself? So I, we currently have, so basically uh, with my product line, I have, there are two product owners, and um, there's a user experience designer for this product line for basically about a, you know, 15 engineers. So. And, and the second half of that was uh, how often and when work is it to break these features down into detailed stories for the team? Well, it's, it's, it's a continuous process. I, I'd say that's, you know, that's something I just, I do on an ongoing basis. You know, I, I would estimate I spend about half my time doing that kind of work and sitting with the team and working on the current iteration, you know, working on breaking down stories. About half my work is sort of the technical side of being a product owner. The other half of it is all the interface with customers and stakeholders. So, what other questions? One right here. I have two questions and they're unrelated, I think. Yeah. Um, first question is, what do you recommend for the composition of the product council? Basically, you need to. I, that's an interesting question. Um, so we've had it, had it be various sizes. We had it up to like 20, 20 plus people at one point, and that was when we were doing more of the the, the sort of fully collaborative style, and and that ended up being quite tricky to to manage. I think. I like, I'm like, with the news, with this Kanban approach, I'm enjoying having the, the VPs there because we have time to get up to a higher level discussion. I find that, that, that um, we have some, um, basically some uh, like sales managers and they're doing okay. I think one, one of the things that I found is that, is that if we include a lot of actual sales reps who are spending the bulk of their time dealing with customers, we end up focusing a lot on the, on the very detail oriented items that, that, that they want. With sales in particular, it's been really important to have somebody who's really focused on sort of consolidating those opinions. And so individual sales reps are usually focused on meeting their quotas and that's, that's hard for them. So um, we've got, you know, we have a couple people from marketing um, you know, a couple people from support, a couple people from services. So, it, you know, it's and it does vary from time to time based on how comfortable people are with what we're we're doing in releases. So at the moment, you know, you know, one of the things that, that my VP of marketing has said to me recently is he really feels like we have things under control. We're really aligned with him with that, and so he doesn't come every every two weeks. He'll he'll come once a month or once every two months now. So it, 
you know, it kind of evolves over time. And, and I would say, sort of as a product owner, you know, right now I have an intuition, for example, I know that the services team isn't showing it up enough, and so I know their voice isn't getting heard as much as it should be within this group. So I'm currently working with them to try to get some of them to show up more often. They're on the road coaching all the time, so it's hard. So you, you kind of have to sort of listen to what are you hearing, and do you feel like it's balanced or not? And yeah. So um, one more question here. Yeah, the second question is, I'll preface this with a comment. Um, I've often thought the product owner or product manager, as in the case of the company I, I was just with, um, should have a long-term vision <laughs> of where the product is headed. Yeah. And it, it relates to your comment on the bigger, having the bigger picture in mind. Yeah. And I, I've rarely seen product owners and product managers have that long-term vision. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you an example from automotive. Uh, there was a 57 t bird that was a real sweet little roadster. Mm -hmm. um, it, over in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the t bird turned into a monster. Mm -hmm. And they, it seemed like Ford had lost that vision. Uh, in the, in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, there was a retro version of the T-Bird that came out that recaptured the initial vision of the two-seat Roadster. Yeah. And it was streamlined, and it was a gorgeous car. And somebody recaptured the vision of what that product was and recreated it. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen software products over the years evolve into monsters because everyone is adding whatever happens to uh, pop into their pill crazed heads. Yeah. And there's no coherence, unity, essence to the thing. Yeah. And I, do you think product managers or product owners should have this vision? And how do they, how do they maintain that when there are all these competing demands for what should go into the software system? You, yeah, you absolutely have to have a vision. I think the default for software is entropy. Basically, if you don't have a clear vision, you're going to get software that becomes more complex and less cohesive over time. Um, so it, it's, it, without a vision, you're, you're going to get that. That's why it happens to so much software. Um, it's, it's tough, you know, and it was hard for me because I'm, you know, you, well, you can see how old I am. I'm not the oldest person in the company. And so for me to come in and say, I have a clear vision for where this product should go, and the rest of you should listen, listen to me and put the rest of your, your ideas on hold is a challenging thing. And it really took a couple of years of, of kind of, you know, working through this process to get to the point where, where you know, we, we on the product team really felt comfortable saying, this is what our vision is. And, you know, it's sort of, it's, you have to sort of define that vision on the product team. You've got to define sort of a roadmap for how you think you're going to get there. And then you have to do a lot of manual selling. So I actually, you know, I was doing this because we're, we sort of embarked on a new project at the beginning of this year. Um, that, you know, and, and what I ended up doing a lot in November and December was going around to each individual stakeholder and saying, you know, tell me about what, you know, what are the key things that, you, that are on your mind? And then and sort of brought those back. And then a couple of weeks later said, well, this is where we're headed and this is how uh, this is how our vision is aligned with your needs. And that was a, a fairly, you know, time-consuming process, but it was really necessary to sort of keep the sort of averaging out that happens in the democratic process from, from destroying the, the, the longer-term focus. So I, I don't see any alternative if you're trying to have a cohesive project to having, you know, a, a person or a small group of people who have a strong vision and a clear vision and sort of and, and who, who are able to, to stick with that. The other thing I found that was interesting is that most people want you to have a vision. And you know, even, if the, even as they're asking for all these little features, you know, they're really happy if you can give them a long-term vision. And, and, and they want something to hold on to. You know, the sale, you know, we have an awesome sales team, and they'll sell whatever we build for them, as long as they feel like it makes sense and they can tell a good story around it. And, 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 and in a lot of ways, if we, give them the, if we help them understand the vision and where we're going, they're happy to work with that. And, and, and that's true of a lot of different people, you know, as long as they know what the parameters are. So question over here. That's more of a comment. Uh, I, having a vision implies that you're saying no to things that aren't in yeah. vision. And I'm not hearing, I actually haven't, I just realized I haven't heard anybody use the word no yeah. talking about product ownership, product development, product management. But that, that's totally essential. Yeah. And I think one of probably one of the causes of a lot of uh, lack of vision that people complain about is the fact that you know whoever is responsible for this vision is not saying no to things that are outside. Yeah. They're not deciding. 
Yeah, and that's, yeah. And that's hard. I think, you know, it, it around uh, December or January of this year, I just started to get pretty depressed because I felt like I was saying no to everybody all the time. I felt like I was just, you know, and it's terrible because you have a support rep who's got this, you know, you've got a, you know, a user in Raja who's really struggling with surreal characters and really wants us to redo the whole app and work with surreal characters. And it's causing pain for this person. And this is one of, you know, this is a very tiny proportion of your population. You've got to say no. At the same time, that person's got to live with it, and the support team's got to deal with it. And it was really taking a lot out of me personally to, to, to be having to say no. And the nice thing about the Kanban approach is it kind of allowed me to reframe things and say, look, I'm not saying no. You know, there, there's certainly, you know, it makes sense to do the Cyrillic stuff. It's just, it's not the thing we're going to do next release. And it's a good, it's an idea, it's something we should explore, we should see how big the market is. It's just not the thing we're doing tomorrow. And that's a little bit different than a no. Um, and, and, and for me as a product owner, it helped me sort of get past that just psychic pain of how, because you don't want to say no all the time as a, as, as a person, especially when people are coming to you with very legitimate needs. I mean, you know, the, there's, you know, the, there are customers who have very specific things that they need to do for, for particular reasons. Um, and. You, you know, I would love to, to give exactly the software that, that, that was all things to all people, to all of them, but it's just not practical. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, so doesn't this, the product backlog and a scrum approach kind of serve a similar purpose? It's giving someone the feeling that they, they're still thinking about the... Yeah, it does. So the, the product backlog for me is, is a finer level of granularity. So really, I'm, you know, the, the, I, I try to keep the product backlog relatively empty so that you know, and, and relatively short, and, and sort of separate out the things that are close to being ready for development that are small and story sized versus the, the bigger picture ideas like, you know, I don't know, we built a recycle bin this year, so that's a pretty large thing. Um, so it, it is a lot like a backlog, but I think it's that, that concept of sort of staging pieces of the backlog so they don't pollute each other, that, that, that is really important. I think, I, do I have time for one, one, or, one more question? Let's try it back there. Uh, when you're working through your Kanban queues, are you looking at, at uh, business cases, actual ROI numbers? That's in in many cases we are, and that's actually something we, we've tried requiring people to have lightweight business cases, especially when they want something to jump the queue and, and, and move ahead. You know, you really have to say, you know, this is worth X amount of dollars for you. It's really hard to quantify dollar value of features, and I, you know, and often the problem is, in a lot of ways, the less significant features are often easier to quantify in dollar value, and the things that are worth a lot more are hard to measure. So, um, so we, we've, we've, we definitely try that. Whenever there's a case of something that wants to jump the queue, it's like, well, how much is this really worth? You know, there's a good, uh, good. We were trying to do something recently, working in support of a partnership, and we actually did the cost. The, the, we figured out the cost of it was about one to one and a half million dollars. Uh, we tried to figure out the potential value of the partnership. It didn't match, and so we, we basically said there has to be a better justification for this than the value you're currently presenting. And that, you know, took, you know, took a, a couple of developers and a couple of product owners a few hours to do, and it was definitely worth it. One more, right here in the middle. So you, you talked about this metaphor of the elephant and how everyone else is wrong. What can you do to, to make sure that you're seeing the, the whole elephant clearly? It, talk to a lot of people. Like I said, I spend about half my time Talking to customers, talking to um, talking to support reps. You know, I sit. Yeah, you know, I sit with the development team, but I'm walking around the office all the time. I'm spending time with sales sales reps on calls with customers. You know, I'm going out to visit customers. So I think it just, it's really just immersion. I mean, my job is to be immersed in hopefully the right proportion of different types of of, of activities, the right proportion of sales activities and that kind of thing. It's just so, yeah. You know. well, Everyone has perspective and bias, right? What you're trying to do is reconstruct an elephant, not, not with a picture of an elephant, but yeah. a description of a road, a description of a pillar, yeah. a description of a tree trunk or a branch or whatever. So, I mean, is there some, can you give like a more uh, prescriptive approach to actually boiling that down, or is that just intuitive? I think, I think it is. You know, it's inter an interesting debate about whether product management is an intuitive process or a data-driven process. It's really, it's some of both. I think, you know, you, the data is very important, you know, as, to, as far as how many customers are requesting this, how, you know, how big are the markets, that kind of thing. So you have to look at that data, but ultimately a lot of the, a lot of the decisions are kind of intuitive. It's, it's you know, the, the question about when you build a feature is really complex. It has to do with what other features, you know, combined with it make a real synergy. Um, what parts of the market can we go after if we have this now versus later. I don't see a good alternative to, to that being an intuitive process. And I think, 
you know, it's it's really hard to train a group to to have that level of intuition effectively. You know, we're we're kind of working on it within our product management team. The other product owner and I and the user experience designer all sit together and try to have that intuition as a group. But it's very it's it, it's a result of lots of face to face interactions, lots of you know close discussions, and and you know how to do that with the with the broader group is you know it's tricky to involve them in in. That intuitive process, it's, it's easier to basically come to the conclusions, test them out, see how they fit, and, and bring them up to speed about how you got there. So that's kind of what I try to do. Uh, and one more question here. How do you manage the relationship between the, the cool screen things on your Kanban list and your fine grained user stories? Which comes first? How do you make sure they sort of correspond well enough with each other? Well, we'll start with the core thing one, and ultimately, you know, you know, if you look at, um, flip back to the, the Kanban here. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, all these are really coarse grain things, recycle bin, subscription merge, report printing, customizable charts, those are all kind of big things. So typically we start with the big ones. I also have a smaller queue of small customer requests and defects that's not managed as part of this process, that, that gets blended in sort of in real time, you know, iteration by iteration with everything else. So, so the, the, the two both feed into the, 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 the backlogs. So, all right. Thanks, everybody.